Welcome everyone um, to the uh, 152nd CG seminar and our further webinar in our series on the pandemic and higher education and how it's playing out around the world. And what we've found so far is that the situation is very nationally contextualized. It's different from place to place. And in the large countries such as India, United States, China, uh, it's different within the country as well. So you get situations where the pandemic has had a much larger effect on um, the provision of higher education, on the pattern of online learning, on the incidence of health and safety problems and so on in some places than in others. Now, there are a few places more important or more affected by the pandemic than India. India concentrates a large proportion of the world's population with 1.2 billion people. Uh, it's been a very difficult pandemic for India, as all pandemics have been for India. A very large country with health services unevenly distributed, regionalisation a major factor in national life, different languages, different, um, different services from place to place. Some states like Kerala have done magnificently well in managing the pandemic, no surprise given Kerala's general record in social services and actions related to the public good and other states have struggled. Um, but we're going to hear from three experts, much more, more expert than me, on the topic of India, uh, higher education and the pandemic. And I'll introduce them in turn, but let me start by uh, opening with the web protocols. Um, remember, as you, those who've, who've been in, in our webinars before will know, uh, you are being recorded and the recording will be posted online on the CG website within a couple of days. A transcript of the chat function will also be made available at that point and the chat discussion is often quite interesting and um, raises some pretty important issues. Now when we come to the conduct of the discussion please keep yourself muted unless you have been asked to speak or ask a question. There's no need to have your video on during the webinar, but uh, please do turn it on when you're asking a question. We recommend that you use the speaker view uh, component in Zoom so you can more clearly see who is talking while what's happening. Now, to ask a question, use the chat function. We encourage you to start to put your questions forward um, at least uh, by about halfway through the, um, the addresses from the speakers because we've it's very helpful for you, I think, to put your question forward early. You're more likely to enter the webinar that way, but it also helps us organize the questions and make sure that each speaker gets a question and so on. Now, when the three um, uh, speakers have finished, we'll then move to the question time. And um, if your question is selected, and we'll give you a warning through the chat if that's the case, then you'll be invited into the webinar to ask it directly. And when you're invited to ask your question, please unmute yourself, most important. Sometimes we forget that when we're in webinars. Um, also switch on your video if you can and state your name and where you are from. That's the end of the housekeeping arrangements. Let me now pass to our three speakers out first. Speaker is Dr. Professor Rupamanjari Ghosh. Dr. Ghosh is the current Vice Chancellor of Shivnada University. She's held that position since February 2016. And she joined the university in 2012 as the founding director of the School of Natural Sciences and the Dean of Research and Graduate Studies. She's a physicist by background. Uh, and her research interests include experimental and theoretical quantum optics, laser physics, nonlinear optics, and quantum information. Dr. Ghosh is well known for her um, efforts to support the cause of gender justice and environmental consciousness in higher education. I think you will agree, a most appropriate person to talk about the pandemic higher education in India. Dr. Ghosh. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this webinar. You know, the canvas is big, so I'll start with some broad strokes. And uh, in the question and answer, I'm 
expecting to learn some things from all of you. So uh, today everybody is talking about the new normal, the scale of the problem in this country is of course large and uh, our approach, uh, you know, I'll talk about my experience at the Shibnada University and then I'll generalize that a bit. My uh, approach was to respond to the VUCA world, you know, the volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous world with our VUCA, that is vision, understanding, clarity and agility. So agility has been the key. We are only uh, nine year old, so it's a young university. So age was on our side. So there's a lot of technology enablement and agility that uh, in the vision and everything that we did, it was there. So I also believe the, the large country has a lot of problems that you just mentioned. Uh, I don't believe in any knee jerk reaction. So allow me to take you to pre-COVID, that is yesterday's context, and I think I'll just move from there because we are not past those issues either. So uh, pre-COVID, what were we uh, grappling with even in January? Uh, we are talking about industry 4.0. That is the current trend in automation, data exchange in manufacturing technologies. So which would include cyber physical systems. And we are uh, saddened to see the disruption to a lagging education sector. So the education sector is lagging behind technology. So everything felt disruptive. And uh, we dreamt of a new India in which, like before, the university education should drive and not just respond to industry or technology. You know, that was our big dream uh, with, with, with which we started this university. And this has been a talk that uh, I've been leading in this country. And for that, of course, we needed competent leadership and of course, resources. And that's a problem for this country. And this is a process of enablement you enable first before you actually evaluate. So because education without quality serves no purpose. And that has been our problem when we expanded uh, the higher education sector, we had to pay attention to the quality. Combined with this, the, the lagging uh, education sector and the disruption, combined with that, there's a panic about what we call uh, the future of work. Uh, I keep asking my students, will an algorithm take away your job? Uh, will you be just replaced by a computer program? And so what are the humans still good for? If machines are going to take away your jobs, then the universities are not going to uh, educate youngsters to mimic a machine. So uh, we need to come up with our own understanding of what humans are still good for. And social intelligence is one. It's far from being fully automated. Humans, I also believe, have an edge over machines in creativity. So essentially well, the approach that one needed to take is maybe uh, both in curriculum as well as the delivery of the curriculum, the content as well as the delivery of the, uh, of the content is to sort of reinvent everything. So uh, we talked about kind of jokingly, I keep talking about it, that combine the left brain with the right brain, the left brain that's analytical uh, can be coded, uh, combine that with the right brain, which is visual and intuitive, far from being coded. So project-based uh, learning is something, design is something that we have been talking about, not STEM, not science, technology, engineering, mathematics, but STEAM with an extra A for art and design. But for Shibnada University, for us, uh, the curriculum was actually an integrated STEAM classified, like, like, you know, so it's to cater to that. So we have been talking about it, that skilling that Indian, hired, Indian government has been putting a lot of stress on Skilling cannot be taken totally outside the higher education system. This has been my consistent stand. The only skill that will survive in this uh, you know, future of work crisis is the skill of critical thinking and creative problem solving, and also communication, decision-making, leadership. You know, these are the things that should be the output of the higher education system. Now came COVID, and uh, though we had early indications, in early Mar March, where we have this uh, spring festival of Holi, and on that time, I had a one week break. And uh, before the government came up with the lockdown, I had already announced to the faculty that we are going fully online. We had only uh, five days to prepare ourselves. And because we are already technology uh, enabled, in spite of campus lo lockdown, where all travel stopped, board exams got stalled, entrance exam got stalled, placements got deferred, in-person collaboration, national, international, academia, industry, private, public, everything got stalled. But we did not lose a single day. 
Our students' engagement was top priority during this period of isolation. So not just online classes, but everything, including our clubs and societies, they all move to online platforms. I'm going to make a comment on that quality um, uh, shortly, but I think what came, what I really appreciated is collaboration world over. You know, uh, the leadership, of course, matter in times of crisis because I feel it, main, it in maintaining a perspective in a crisis. And that's the major role of leadership. And you lead by example. And the collaborations we had world over, learning from each other because it was new for everybody, though our preparation levels were different. Uh, there is, this has been a great period. So every crisis, there is some part that you have no control over, but there is a, one part of the crisis that's challenging and that throws a lot of opportunities. So as I said, that we did not lose a single day. And one thing that this COVID-19 induced disruption has done is to lay bare the inner workings of universities for all to see. So there's a transparency. We could actually see each other. We, uh, you know, in some decision-making process where I was involved, we could actually now analyze with data. Now, of course, India has many layers and you alluded to that, um, Simon. And 17th century coexists with 21st century, right? So uh, now uh, I cannot just address only the millennials in my university. So uh, we need to address the complex issues and that's a problem by itself. So I'm just painting these broad strokes and we'll come back to that. So a technology of course could be great for delivery of higher education and, uh, but online learning may not be the future. You know, there have been articles coming up and if you take surveys of your students, the, uh, the one important uh, component, the, the stakeholder that's really protesting is, uh, the students. So uh, not just digital classes, India needs dependable online exams, assessment, evaluation systems, and that is totally lacking. But the point I was making is technology enables, but it also limits. We are currently giving students standardized testing <laughs> where everyone gets a similar te test. You know, I'm, I'm a physicist, I love quoting Einstein, but I'll not bore you with all the details. But you know, this standard joke about uh, giving the same test to a fish and a monkey and an elephant saying climb that tree. So if you, uh, in the name of fairness, if everybody gets the same test, then I think the purpose gets defeated. And so I think there are solutions that technology can provide, but I think people find, find the shortcuts. Learning is indeed a designed endeavor and one size, that is one model or one approach does not fit all. The second important point that we, I want to make, and I think that what is happening in India is uh, pedagogy sh should lead the choice of technology. It is happening the other way. What is available, the technology is now dictating the pedagogy. And I think that's the challenge. And I think it should be the other way. We have enough talent on the other side to, uh, to be able to follow the pedagogy that we believe we followed in, 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 in the education system. Uh, the third point is that we now understand that there are two kinds of courses. Some can be 100% online and some other at best 70%. And uh, there are also two kinds of students, if I may say so. Online will work well for one group and not for others. The regular students are dying to come back to the campus. The campus is not just a place for getting a credential. It's uh, the peer-to-peer -peer learning, the social interactions, everything contributes to your education, which is 360 degree holistic education. There's another thing that happened that I'm sure Swamin would touch upon uh, well, he's in the field. In July, the union cabinet approved the national education policy, NEP 2020. And uh, it advocates major reforms in higher education, a holistic and multidisciplinary education, flexibility of subject choices, program durations, multiple entry exit, et cetera. So, uh, this is what we at Shivnada University have been practicing and advocating. And this policy gives us new energy to our vision and approach. 20 institutions of eminence, you know, we happen to be one. Though we are the youngest in the 10 private, 10 public institutions were chosen by the government as institutions of eminence, and we are one. So we are being asked to implement this uh, undergraduate curriculum from the next session. We have been doing it from 2011. So uh, while it has become fashionable, to talk about liberal arts, uh, Swamin should not take offense. I mean, he knows my ways. So one side, it's very fashionable to talk about liberal arts, which I keep saying that liberal arts is not liberal arts. Without science and mathematics, you can't really have liberal arts. So uh, uh, and we have been doing that. 
and then disruptive technologies like AI, ML, VR on the other, we must remember that pure and fundamental science, pure and fundamental social science have played a pivotal role in shaping the world. Today we need uh, clean energy, advanced materials, water, sustainability, health. These extremely important issues, uh, you know, disruptive technologies alone will not be able to solve all societal problems. So students and faculty must know the career options in science and its significance in research and development. I think between these two fashionable things of liberal arts and disruptive technology, maybe you're forgetting some of the basics. Uh, last point that I want to make is if you look at history, innovation, that's the catchy, fashionable world everybody's talking about. Innovation doesn't come just from giving people incentives. It comes from creating environments where their ideas can connect. This is not my original quote. This quote is from Steven Johnson. And uh, so teaching learning process has to be research and innovation driven. And there is a hands-on component in it. I talked about recapitulation. This is that I talked about design and project-based learning uh, with this uh, innovation emph emphasis is essentially enterprise education, if I might call it. So uh, not necessarily entrepreneurship, but enterprise education application. You teach people financial literacy, give them financial literacy, business plans, et cetera, et cetera. So, and then uh, gone are the days of individual institutions becoming big. So this is an era of ecosystems of partners. So strong, equitable, credible partnerships, national and international, academic, industrial, public, private. So this is what is necessary. And I believe universities should be driving these partnerships, should be the center of all of that and maintain quality. So a friend of mine keeps on saying that, you know, um, education, uh, because I, uh, what I talked about is hands-on, and that's the part we are missing on online. Education should be hands-on, minds-on, and hearts-on. Uh, the hands-on part of it, of course, got a little crippled by the COVID for certain disciplines. But uh, what we need to think about is not discontinued from pre-COVID, but higher education should prepare for new and unexpected developments. That's the big lesson for me in this, that not everything goes according to plan. And that's the biggest strength of higher education systems, that it prepares you for new and unexpected developments. Uniqueness of individuals is extremely important because that's where churning of ideas would lead to new, new knowledge. And a good university should be known as before by its ability to generate knowledge, to create knowledge and not just consume knowledge. So I'll stop here and I'll be waiting to listen to others. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ghosh. Um, some, some great uh, quotes there. Hands on, minds on and hearts on. Uh, and um, expect the unexpected. And yes, we are flexible, aren't we? We've, I think so far done very well. If we have the right level of government support, um, we can do a lot more. Um, it's a pleasure to bring in my colleague, um, Simon Chattopadhyay at um, JNU in Delhi. Simon is a faculty member at the Zaki Hussain Center for Educational Studies in the School of Social Sciences at, at Jawaharlal Nehru University. He, he did his PhD on the black economy in, in India, which he says that is much larger than the normal economy, um, much larger than we think, maybe it's 95%. Of the of economic transactions, which are, I, th I found extraordinarily interesting, um, but perhaps not centrally uh, uh, of interest to the pandemic, but nonetheless interesting. Um, he's, Simon's got a, a history of work on policy-related issues, which draw on econ economic expertise, drawing on his um, qualities as an economist of education and uh, one of the world's experts on the economics of higher education. Uh, it's a pleasure to bring him in, and I'll do so right now. Simon. So thanks, uh, Professor Markinson, for uh, giving an opportunity to me to join you here in the panel discussion. I, I understand my slides are visible to all of you, right? Yes. Uh, so let me come straight to the point. What I want to do to, in order to situate the discussion on how the pandemic has affected or is going to uh, determine the way the university system is going to evolve in the post-pandemic era. Let me begin with the context first. The context uh, uh, for the audience here, I would 
very briefly mention about some of the very critical structural feature of Indian higher education. It is the third largest in the world and the gross enrollment rate is hovering around 27 to 28% approximately at the present moment. But the quality has remained a concern. Very often the corporates do complain that the graduates are not employable and the Indian universities uh, do not feature in the global ranking in a very significant manner. There are some universities within the range of 200 to 300. Enrollment in the private higher education is around two thirds of the total enrollment in higher education. And this is very, very important to understand the dynamics of the Indian higher education system. Public funding for higher education would be around 1.25% of GDP. For education as a whole, it is around 4.4% of GDP. Uh, students mobility, we send 10 students abroad and we receive only one. Outbound would be approximately 2,65,000, uh, but the inbound would be around 30,000 or so. In fact, India is the second most important sending country after China uh, in the world today. As on 2018, uh, number of international students studying abroad was around 7 lakh, you know, uh, uh, 7,53,000. Uh, let me begin with the new uh, national education policy, which was unveiled on 29th of July. And this policy, very briefly, I would touch upon some of the very key recommendations to understand how the system is going to evolve in the post pandemic era. Uh, as I understand, the new education policy uh, is willing to give freedom to the students to choose their courses, is going to give freedom to the teachers in terms of their academic freedom, maybe it's on paper, and higher education institutions uh, to evolve as autonomous multidisciplinary research institutions over a period of time. And this freedom will actually help in construction of a quasi market for education. Uh, one major policy initiative the government claims there is a going to be a setup uh, they're going to set up an academic bank of credit where the students can earn credit and store digitally so it means that the students are going to given uh, the going to be given the flexibility to choose the courses which can uh, be staggered over a period of time the gross enrollment rate uh, to be achieved 50 percent by 2035 however by 2025 50% of the enrollment should be from vocational education. Phasing out of the affiliated colleges and new regulatory institutions are going to be set up and reconfiguration of the old ones. There'll be a, a national research foundation to disburse fund for doing research, just one body. Uh, there's a focus on leadership, strong and assertive. Uh, one major uh, policy recommendation is that the public funding of education should be raised center plus state together to 6% of GDP. It has been on the agenda for pretty long, but we have not been able to achieve. Uh, the national education policy uh, emphasizes on uh, philanthropic private participation and very critical of commercialization of education, which is inimical to the quality that Indian higher education has been able to produce. In the governance real, there's a major change. The universities are supposed to uh, submit their plan to the higher education grants council and the future plan would be determining how much fund that they would be getting in addition to the research fund that they would be getting from nrf and there's also uh, legislation as mooted uh, to allow top 100 foreign universities to come and operate in india these are the major policy recommendations but what is important here for today's talk is to see how there is a gentle nudge to move towards the uh, online education and opting for the courses, the MOOCs from the e-platform that the government has set up, particularly the soil. If I may read the particular sentence to understand what is in the mind of the policymaker, it is from national education policy. The recent rise in the epidemics and pandemics necessitates that we are ready with alternative mode, modes of quality education whenever and wherever traditional and in-person modes of education are not possible. The national education policy recognizes the importance of leveraging the advantages of technology while acknowledging its potential risk and dangers. And in the national education policy, several steps have been mooted uh, to, to effect that particular transition that we are talking about. Like, like we are planning to have world-class digital infrastructure as well as the content. Now, three days after the national education policy was announced, there was an UGC circular called expression of interest 
where the students are going to be given uh, sufficient freedom to offer the courses from the MOOCs platform. Uh, the Swayam platform, earlier it was 20%, it was raised to 40% per semester. And at the, in the same letter, UGC says uh, they are uh, inviting uh, interest from the faculty to offer 171 undergraduate level MOOCs courses in humanities and social sciences. And then there was an, another letter, 27th of August from the UGC. It says there's a need to sustain the momentum generated for online courses during the pandemic and extending up to the rural area as envisioned by the Honorable Prime Minister. So what you can see here, that there is a distinct uh, policy thrust to help us transit to uh, the, the new system where we'll be uh, relying on online education and we'll be allowing the students to offer the courses offered by the e-platform. I will share with you two key, uh, uh, two, two key surveys conducted in the context of India and abroad. Uh, there was a study which was led by Professor Bhushan in Inupa based on 543 higher education institutions to take stock of how the higher education system was responding to the pandemic, to the, lock, to the, to the lockdown. I'll just mention a couple of highlights. 63% of the higher education institutions said that less than 50% of the online classes could be held till end of June. 76 to 80 percent, uh, rural 80 and urban 76 percent, they said that exam could not be held before end of June. And 27 percent of government higher education institutions admitted that they did not have adequate Wi-Fi facility. The other institutions did have, but in varying extent, right? It was not adequate for the conduct of the online classes. Uh, there was another survey, the QA survey of the prospective students who are willing to go abroad based on 11,000 students from India. And the study reveals <clears throat> there's a 61% of the students who are planning to go abroad. They plan to defer their course of study till 2021. 8% would, uh, they intend to study in a different country. 7% cancel plan to study abroad. And 40% said they are not keen to study if the program is offered online. And 82% of the students, they wanted a tuition fee discount if the program is offered online. Uh, <clears throat> I'll be mentioning about uh, three cases where the court intervened to resolve the conflict that arose in the context of the implementation of the UGC policy. The first case is with regard to the Delhi University, Delhi High Court, uh, this uh, regarding the conduct of the end semester examination. Uh, it was failed that the end semester examination would be conducted as an open book examination, OBE. But the court wanted to know from Delhi University that first you hold the mock test and you share the data of the mock test with the court. And depending on the data revealed in the mock test, the court would give a go ahead to the Delhi University to conduct the test. So the two mock tests were conducted on July 27 and August 4, and the data had to be shared with the court. Now, out of, out of 1,53,000 students, only 50% logged in out of those who registered. 153,000 students, only 50% logged in. And those who logged in, only 36%, 35.6% could upload their answer script uh, for the evaluation. In fact, I'm told that the faculty in some Delhi University colleges where they are till 12 a.m. in the morning or 1 a.m. in the morning, uh, they're waiting for the students to send the scanned answer script. Uh, Delhi High Court also instructed the Delhi University to facilitate the declaration of the results of those students who are willing to go uh, abroad for further studies. In fact, Delhi University has to, had to assure the Delhi High Court that they would share the results of those students who are willing to go abroad confidentially with the universities that they are applying for. This is the kind of, this is the extent of judicial interventionism that we witness in case of Delhi University. Some of the steps mooted for Delhi University, setting up of a grievance redressal committee to listen to the students, their, their complaints, their problems, their challenges that they faced while taking the examination so that the open book examination can be conducted smoothly. Common service centers, they were remotely available. It is under the Ministry of Electronics. And uh, the students complained that uh, when they approached the common service centers, very often common service centers said, that they can't accommodate because they have not been duly informed by the Delhi University as reported in the newspaper. Delhi University also launched a one Delhi University, one DU flagship program. 
to integrate and unify all the teaching activities in one platform. So you can see how we are veering towards that. And there's an additional expenditure incurred to help the differently able and visually challenged students. Uh, to get a flavor of the kind of argumentation that took place in the court, the judges remarked, don't take it amiss. There is no ego battle here. How can you have any interest which is contrary to the students? Your readiness, that means the readiness of the Delhi University, your readiness has been questioned thrice. You are not able to satisfy the court. Delhi University Teachers Association, the DUTA, argued that any form of online or blended teaching would be discriminatory because of the existing digital divide. In fact, the visually challenged students and the different level students, they also protested because of no, not availability of any reading materials, poor access to the net, and the technical glitches that they kept on facing. The second case of uh, this uh, court case is between the government of India, UGC, Supreme Court, and it is regarding the conduct of the national level engineering and medical examination. The test were uh, postponed twice. It was supposed to be held in April, and then it was supposed to be held in July. Finally, both the engineering and medical entrance examinations have been held in this month. It became a national issue because the students approached the court, six states, and they were ruled by the opposition, uh, opposition parties. They also uh, approached the court, but the court uh, allowed the government of India, the uh, National Testing Agency, to conduct the examination. And all the pleas, the several petitions were filed, and all the pleas were dismissed, and in the last one was not entertained by the Supreme Court. Supreme Court said, life cannot be stopped. Career of students cannot be put in jeopardy. Attendance in the engineering examination was lower by 20 percentage points, 74 percent compared to 94 percent in the previous year. But for the medical, it was reasonably good, 85 to 90 percent out of 1.6 million who applied. The last example is the UGC, Supreme Court, and the states. Uh, earlier, UGC gave freedom to the universities to conduct the examination online and offline uh, and uh, declare the results. And some universities did declare the results. And the results were based on the previous year because the examination could not be conducted. The previous year results were incorporated to declare the final result. UGC later reversed his earlier order and insisted that the degrees cannot be given without holding examination. After all, it has got to do with the future of the students and some of them are going abroad. So they will suffer for the rest of their life if the mark sheet remains incomplete. States approached the Supreme Court to contest the UGC's direction to hold the examination by end of September. Now, some of the states have been given the option to complete the examination by end of October. And then today's newspapers say UGC academic calendar for 2021 has been rescheduled. Finally, classes would begin from 1st of November. Vacations are likely to be canceled in 2022, six days a week to compensate for the uh, number of hours that we are supposed to be in the classroom. And if the students cancel their registration, there's a possibility of full refund. So what happens to the public good character of higher education? I would aim uh, very briefly mentioning this. Number one, this public good character has to be understood within a national context, socioeconomic and political, and the policy response and the structure of higher education system. All will impinge on, on the determination of the public good character of higher education. The first thing is, there's a problem with access. And there's a possibility that the rise that you have witnessed in gross enrollment rate might uh, experience a dip because of this uh, digital divide and fall in income. The second is the shrinkage of the public sphere, the socialization of campus uh, that is going to suffer for this semester and in future also, I'm not too sure when we are moving towards online education, to what extent the socialization of campus can be restored to its previous level. And the third is the, the, the structural differentiation that exists within the higher education system is going to be further accentuated because the market is going to be bipolar almost, and <clears throat> higher education as a positional good will emerge uh, as, a, as a very strong force. And, and, and this kind of differentiation will ultimately impact the question of accessibility and equity that we are talking about. Let me stop here. Thank you. Well, thank you, Simon. I mean, that was a very salutary, I might say. Uh, there's a lot of warnings in there, but you know, very useful um outline of the issues and the examples that you gave of recent cases were very helpful um we now have 126 127 people participating in the webinar which is good i'd like to bring in our third speaker Giorgi aurora 
Chioti is a PhD scholar at the Zaki Hussain Center for Educational Studies in the School of Social Sciences at JNU in Delhi. She's currently working in the area of university rankings. Chioti. Uh, thank you, Professor Morganson. I hope I am audible. Yes, you are. Speak so up. before uh, before I start, I would like to uh, uh, you know thanks CGHE for giving me the opportunity uh, to share this panel with you, so and also with the eminent speakers. So after listening to uh, the uh, observations uh, made by uh, Professor Ghosh and Professor Professor Chattopadhyay, I would be sharing. Uh, student experiences uh, among, uh, in this time of pandemic in the higher education. Uh, when I say student, I would be referring to the students who are enrolled in public higher education system. And uh, my observations or comments may or may not adhere to the students who are into the private sector. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, before uh, beginning to share the challenges, just to draw a con context that Currently, India is uh, in the massification stage with overall GER, gross national gross enrollment ratio of 26.3%, and um, which has a lot of inequalities uh, based on social, economic, religion, and regional factors. 60.53% uh, of colleges are, and 56.2 uh, standalone institutions are currently located in rural areas, and the highest proportion of students are enrolled in undergraduate programs. Now, if we talk about the Indian economy, the GDP per capita as measured in 2019 was 2,169 US dollars and the workforce employed in an unorganized sector is accounted for around 93%. So we can think of how much proportion of our labor force is under the uh, under the um, organized sector and they have the rights and all the uh, coverages that are there. Uh, as per one of the uh, survey uh, Statista, uh, reported by Statista.com, uh, it's only 26.26% 26 uh, 26 of the population who has uh, access to smartphones. So hardly uh, one fourth of the population has uh, the smartphone. And currently the unemployment rate uh, is reported at 20 3.5% uh, and uh, some of the uh, newspapers reported that uh, it's almost 40, 41 lakh youth who have lost the job amid, amid this pandemic and 5 million salaried Indian also lost their job. So it's not just the salaried people but also because of the economic downturn, uh, the businesses are also under loss. Uh, next slide please. Uh, so when this uh, entire pandemic issue uh, came up. Uh, it, it was unprecedented and we were not uh, prepared for it. And the first death that was re uh, reported in India was on March 12, 2020. And this uh, became a turning point for all of our students because it was then the universities issued uh, the notice for the students to get their hostels on emergency basis. Uh, so this was all happening when uh, there was disruption in public transport and there were bottles sealed. So a lot of students could not afford uh, safe travel and uh, they got contracted with the virus and also became uh, uh, you know, carriers for, uh, uh, for this virus uh, in their native places. Uh, so that was a risky call for all the students. However, some of the universities did provide them uh, an option to stay back. Uh, in their hostels, but then the proportion was really less. So those of uh, some some uh, students who could not afford to move, um, they look out for uh, safe places with their guardians or peers uh, in the neighbor um, uh, states or areas. But it was uh, on, uh, in September, uh, which marked as unlock unlock 4.0 in India. Uh, there was some relaxation as for the PhD students and also students of post graduation uh, for the technical and professional programs to uh, access the university or institutions. However, because of disruption of uh, uh, public transport, there is still a restriction of uh, students to access the universities or institutions. So now why, uh, why there is still a restriction or the universities are not opened up because we can see from the graph that 
the daily uh, cases are actually rising. It's rising after June, much after the lockdown, uh, you know, happened. And this was also the time when there was a relaxation in the lockdown. So actually the number of cases began after uh, relaxing the lockdown guidelines. Uh, next slide, please. So here are some of the challenges uh, which in fact, uh, Professor Ghosh and Professor Chattopadhyay also referred to. Uh, first is about the digital device, uh, digital uh, divide, but it's not so just the divide as we can see that uh, all India uh, access to computer and internet is very low and there is further great inequality among the rural and the urban center as well as uh, among the socio-economic classes. However, it's also about financing these new resources and the quality of the digital resources available to the Indian students given the low per capita income and uh, most of the students now coming from first generation or uh, you know they're first generation learners and coming from disadvantaged groups so this becomes a major uh, you know issue so while our classes are there online or uh, we are having by and by voices there are a lot of uh, discontinuity and connectivity issues coming there so um, also because of of the reason that um, one of my friend who who has the uh, you know smartphone but uh, not so expensive or uh, updated technology that she could access to features like zoom and uh, google meet and also there are issues in the remote areas they have to travel to the open fields to really look for uh, the digital uh, you know connectivity uh, so it's it's not so that everyone is having a wi-fi or having a power power backup at their homes so there is a lot of challenges that are coming up even if they can access through uh, you know the data card so wi-fi is still a luxury i would say in the indian setup for the households uh, here is where uh, there is lack of uh, you know institutional and peer support because these first generation learners coming from disadvantaged section uh, do had um, uh, uh, opportunity or support from their institutions and peer uh, before the lockdown and they could access to computer labs and uh, internet services or maybe the peers to get that support and uh, really seek and uh, move forward in, in their learning but because of the current lockdown uh, even that option is not available. This again is coupled by some of the financial uh, aspects that there is no relaxation in the fees as Professor Chattopadhyay also mentioned that students wanted to have relaxation in tuition fees, but students are even bound to or forced to pay mess fees of the hostel, which they are actually not availing. They are back their home, but then there is no relaxation coupled with that there are so many delays with um, issues coming up with the scholarships and the grants by uh, the institutions and UGC. So because uh, the current pro uh, admissions are on provisional basis and the institutions are already struggling with uh, financial sustainability and uh, collaboration to bring in uh, uh, self-financing uh, avenues uh, that uh, the current students are not uh, eligible in fact to enroll for these uh, uh, scholarships. They can also not go for centrally sponsored schemes because their admission is provisional and unless they get the final uh, uh, admission, they cannot even uh, apply for these uh, uh, schemes. Also to mention that here uh, UGC do came forward for our support uh, for already existing students uh, that um, they did uh, an auto uh, approval of already existing schemes. However, there are many issues cropping up because there were some delays from the administration in uh, uploading the details of the students and here UGC was actually helpless. And administration did no res uh, you know, responsibility or uh, empathy towards students so as to really respond in this dire need when there is so much of jobless, uh, joblessness and uh, financial crunch in the economy. And many of these students are actually supporting their families with the scholarships. So uh, this, there's a delay in scholarship and also now UGC is, uh, uh, there is a delay in re reimbursement of scholarships because uh, UGC is short of funds. They do not have funds. So it's all the more even difficult for students, especially coming from economically weaker section. Here is where I uh, would like to say that students uh, do not have that agency in a sense that uh, they cannot exercise their choice. Uh, we are uh, 
uh, burdened with you know deadlines and given our home environment and the situation in our society uh, we were bound to meet all these deadlines uh, however it was really challenging there were a lot of anxieties but at the same time uh, as a student what we could feel is um, when uh, professor gosh said that um, there's a teaching learning you know uh, which is innovation based you know there's a component of innovation critical thinking that could not happen uh, if we are not having these experiences and deliberations and there is a lot more compromise on the content of the curricula uh, which has been reduced so as to uh, just finish up things as early as possible the major problem that is also coming up with the students is to the access of uh, e resources through remote portals either they are completely uh, absent in many of the state universities and regional universities or they are inadequate even we could not access to many good journals that are available so it's like we are just doing our best whatever is possible uh, next slide please um as professor chatopadhyay mentioned about uh, OBE of uh, DU that is open book examinations and other examinations like JEE and NEET uh, which are happening online face to face mode or both depending on university's call however um, there is a risk of contracting virus because students have to travel all along from another state to a, you know central place to give these uh, uh, examinations uh, here i would really want to point that public transport is not something very normal there is a disruption discontinuance so we need to really ponder that uh, not everyone can afford safe trans travel in this time uh, also uh, there are a lot of issues in a sense that we can see on my uh, screen that there is a case reported that bihar boy had to travel 700 km for neat exam but he got delayed for 10 minutes only and he was denied the entry uh, as per the norm so here Uh, it's becoming challenging for the students to really travel far off to give these uh, uh, these uh, exams. Also, in a sense that um, because we were not prepared, we did not um, had access to uh, the learning resources. Uh, many students, especially undergraduate students, uh, could not take many logistics along with them because they were in hurry while leaving, and we had no idea how long this uh, situation would prevail. so they actually reported that many of them do not have the study material to prepare for the examination and somehow they took support from the peers uh, through whatsapp or emails or they just uh, went to um, um, mediocre sites to have such kind of uh, resources just to give their exams also when there is a clear digital divide and we are conducting online examination and as professor chatopadhyay also reported that students uh, fail to upload their answer sheets well on time so there was a lot of anxiety and uh, uh, systemic problems that were inherent there and it's not just about giving the examination but how well we are giving it is also a question that we need to ponder how much learning has taken place how much critical thinking that we are um, developing and the insights that we are developing also one of the fact that um, examinations actually postponed for four to five times especially open book examination and uh, sometimes it did happen that the circular came just a day before that the exam has been postponed that brings into another kind of uh, anxiety and confusion among the student community next slide please there is also a uh, uncertainty aspect at various levels that would now shape the demand for higher education one is that obviously the employment and the job opportunities especially for the fresh graduates there are certain industries which are completely uh, down in a sense that like hospitality designing many projects new projects are on hold so even the big force this month uh, they announced um, uh, that uh, they won't be hiring uh, the students anymore and for all those who have hired they won't be joining uh, any soon Uh, it may take 6 months it may take 2 years so students are in now uh, in dilemma what to do next also in certain industries uh, uh, the job market is such that they are not ready to hire uh, the fresh graduates and uh, no more uh, placements are happening now so without employment opportunities in the market uh, students don't know what to feel where their future lies uh, next is about the professional courses because here uh, sorry professional courses because here 
uh, skills uh, do matter and uh, one cannot just get dependent on the online education. Uh, there are internships. They did uh, enroll some of the fellows did enroll in the internship, but then because that was happening online, uh, they could not get the experience of a world work culture as would have been in the normal times. There is also a lot of uncertainty in terms of research and fieldwork, especially for the students who are into the primary research studies. Many departments have now um, gave the guidelines for them to completely change their topics and push towards the secondary research so as to complete their research on time, especially the uh, MPhil uh, students or the uh, master students, because we don't know how long this uh, would continue. Also, the students aspiring to go abroad, uh, uh, many universities did not give them choice to defer their admission this time. And there is a high risk that if they discontinue um, the course, they may or may not get in the future. So either they have to opt for it and place themselves on the risk and in a hope or else discontinue and move forward. So there is a high opportunity cost for higher education to continue. Uh, next slide, please. This brings to me the aspect of yeah, just about to oversaw uh, to the mental health and the home environment. Uh, it's, it was difficult for many students to adapt to the home environment because they went, they returned their home after five to seven years of time. And uh, uh, there were also instances reported that while giving the examination, something happened at home and the student had to suffer from the panic attack, but they had no option but to continue and somehow complete their examination and submit it somehow. Also, this is very much important for uh, females, girls, because they have to negotiate for to pursue higher education. Now they are back home and we don't know how, uh, when they'll come and how much negotiation they have to go under. And there are many suicide uh, cases have been reported. Next slide, please. So I'll end up with these questions, but the last remark would be that uh, we do not have data to trace the students uh, and do that kind of planning. And the important question that we all need to ponder is that who suffers the most? It is the first generation learners and the students from disadvantaged groups. And as Professor Bush said, that online education work for some, but not for others. And university space is a safe space for many of our students. So we really need to think whether we can really substitute university space with the uh, digital space. I'll stop here. Thank you so much. I'm sorry for taking uh, more time. Georgia, that was a wonderful set of data. Um, thank you very much. I think we know more about um, Indian higher education at a world level as a result of that presentation. Thank you. Um, the, the concept of 10 minutes has become a little elastic today. And unfortunately, we only have another seven minutes on the schedule uh, and we've got 13 questions. Um, I think we'll be able to get in because we tend sometimes to go over the by about five minutes. I think we can probably get in one question and answer for each speaker. So I'm going to proceed that way. Um, and I've got a, a question selected for each of our three speakers. Um, I'll start with a question for Simon. Um, this is the big overview question, which all three speakers have been pointing towards. Um, I mean, the, the analysis of Indian higher education as a system has been that it's essentially a two tier system with, um, face-to-face uh, -face institutions servicing the um, student population of, uh, on a larger, more comprehensive basis, universities, public universities especially, now some private universities. And then there's been a very large uh, college sector where the colleges are mostly small, uh, majority are in the rural areas, and there are persistent concerns about their quality. So the feeling that, that you know, the colleges, many, most of which were set up through state governments uh, and through a process which is not rigorous in terms of standards, um, uh, that the, the India needs to evolve beyond this and establish a stronger mass higher education sector in terms of quality. Um, so if you like a two tier system, but a third tier, of course, the most important tier, the, the, those who are not participating at all, who are outside tertiary education opportunities. So a three tier system. Now we're looking at the prospect that online education will become much more important in India. And there's even a sense in coming through in the NEP, perhaps that the colleges can be revisited and, and that whole sector can be improved perhaps, but that online education might become more important. 
And that's certainly what's coming from the Prime Minister and the government, that after the pandemic, online education, having been pioneered at this scale in the pandemic, could become a large provider of mass higher education. So you can see the potential here for a new kind of three-tiered system, if you like. The public universities and similar institutions, larger institutions with face-to-face -face offerings, the online sector is the sort of becoming a more important mass sector. Um, where the colleges then go, I'm not sure, but there's still a third tier. And that third tier was graphically illustrated in Giotti's presentation where she showed us that digital, um, digital um, capacity is, is a minority in India, a small minority. And in the cases of um, uh, underrepresented groups, poorer groups, rural communities, the people who have access to the internet and the to internet and computer, very small proportion. So the, most people will be outside higher education altogether if online provision becomes the majority provision at the mass level. Is that where we're going, Simon? And what can, can it be headed off? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I believe that uh, online education is inevitable but uh, the government has to pump in a good deal amount of resources to build up the infrastructure. And unless we build up the infrastructure and spend enough money on the students to acquire the uh, updated gadgets, uh, we'll not be in a position to uh, push for equity and quality. Both will be compromised unless and until we have a level playing field. And that is mm -hmm. why I believe the government should on a mission mode should uh, equip the teachers, equip the universities, spend more on uh, digital technology and see who are the students. Can you identify, as Jyoti was mentioning, can you identify who all are unable to attend the classes and who all can come? But uh, I should end by saying that online education uh, should be resorted to uh, not as a substitute. Possibly we are moving towards a blended mode, but there is no substitute for in-line, uh, in-classes experiences, the universities, the time and the space should not be dented by the online education, no way. So, uh, so this, uh, uh, this push, when we don't have the requisite infrastructure, I believe that we have to go a little slow, uh, find uh, how uh, we can equip the students at the universities and the teachers to deal with the online classes and then you uh, actually give a nudge. So uh, the, the point was that you know, if the system is three-tiered and uh, there's a great deal of uh, differentiation within the system. This uh, push is a little too uh, rushed, I believe, and therefore it will further accentuate the, accentuate the differentiatedness of the higher education system. So I think we have to go a little slow and spend enough money on infrastructure. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, it all makes sense, but it's an immense challenge, isn't it? Um, I've got a question now for Professor Ghosh, and it's coming from Hashita Tripathi. Ashita, can you come in, please? Yes, yeah, yes. Hi. Yes. Hello. Uh, hello, Professor. So here's the quick question I have that given the NEP and the online transition, which was due to the pandemic, do you think that traditional universities will survive the post-COVID era? As in, this is a not so very optimistic question, but given the scenarios, uh, the way we are moving towards the online transition and, and it might be just a coincidence that we have an EP at this moment, uh, are we implying or do we think that we're just losing out on the traditional universities? Well, uh, great question, but I think uh, two of us, Omen and I have been uh, hinting at this. I believe that there would be no substitute for a physical face-to-face -face, uh, transaction. Uh, these are for students who come for specific degree education and not just a credential. Online is for those who are already in a job. Maybe they want a quick fix for something and that works very, very well. So I think it's a hybrid model to stay. Uh, we should not lose out on the positive side of technology when we get ourselves equipped. We'll use that at the same time. Uh, technology, as I say, you know, uh, it enables, but it also limits. So I think uh, there is no limitation to the human capability, as I'm seeing right now. Uh, learning and education is actually uh, more, much more than just delivering the content of a curriculum, right? So I think even that, the hands-on training that I'm talking about, even COVID research, 
we cannot do without our scientists being actually in the lab. So I think uh, there is no substitute for uh, you know hands-on <laughs> training, and online would stay because you know compared with the scenario where there is no education, no access at all. So compared to that, online would do some of the basics, but as I have been saying, without quality, education has actually no meaning, higher education, because then it doesn't serve any purpose at all. Uh, so th there are many ifs and buts in here. The government also has to uh, push, push uh, the infrastructure part in. And I, in my university, you know, what we did is also uh, educate the teachers. And COVID came, one point nobody's mentioning, it was like a immediate surgery. We needed to do something and we sort of did it. But I think now after uh, June, when we finished our semester, the, it was stock taking and we learned a lot from those uh, four months of experience. And so next semester started with a lot of preparation. We had faculty development workshops totally geared towards online teaching. The quality has to actually uh, improve. And the best is people like Jyoti, you know, the feedback has to come from the stakeholders. So I think this process would be on and uh, we'll take the best of technology and the best of face-to-face. -face. So some kind of a hybrid system would be on. I don't think brick and mortar universities are going to go away. They would come back with a lot of more forces. You know, now COVID has shown the way. That's my belief. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Ghosh and Hashita. Um, our uh, re remaining question is for Jyoti and it's from Shubhangi Raman. Shubhangi, can you come in with your question about the position of students paying for hostel mess and other institutional fees? I think you'll need oh, to. Yeah. yeah, we can now hear you. So far away. Yeah. Uh, so my question is basically, amidst the pandemic, Indian universities are still forcing their students to pay for hostel fees mess fees and other institutional fees despite, despite continuous protests from students. Do you think UGC should regulate fees or what uh, other steps can be taken to mitigate this uh, problem? Yeah, so that's my question. Like some of the universities Thank you, Shubhangi, for the question. In fact, this is not the issue where, which is uh, specific to higher education. Similar kind of protests are also happening for the school education as well, because the way uh, schools are charging these uh, you know, uh, fees and there is no reduction or any sort of relaxation. So yeah, UGC can definitely intervene and uh, uh, listen to uh, this uh, you know, pain of students, and especially when there is a lot of uh, economic downturn happening. Uh, some universities did uh, give students uh, uh, time that if they fail to pay fees right now, they may uh, pay it later or after some time when the things will resume, but ultimately they had to pay. So in our university also students really uh, demanded for relaxation, but then uh, uh, nothing of that sort came up right uh, as of now. But there is uh, certainly uh, some postponement or some extension given to the students. So I think, yeah, uh, UGC or maybe ministry has to really intervene and really think that what alternatives can we have in terms of fee and scholarships. Thank you. Thank you, Jyoti. Um, it's, it's a great pleasure to um, have, have all three of you on the webinar today. I'd like to thank you sincerely. And um, I think you've done something to bring forward uh, a lot of information and a sense of uh, interpretation and of the problems to the world audience. Um, India is a very important country for all of us. I mean, what happens in India affects everyone. Uh, and in a lot of ways, when we look to India, we look to the future. You know, we look to solutions as well as problems. And um, uh, there's a sense in which with these 1.2 billion people can get, get on top of some of these challenges that this nation fa great nation faces, then other parts of the world can also tackle those challenges with confidence. Um, our next webinar on Thursday, will discuss Paul Ashwin's book, Transforming University Education, just released, very interesting and important book. Um, and we look forward to welcoming everyone back then. But meanwhile, we'll stay tuned on India. We'll come back to India again in the webinar series before too long and develop further some of this discussion. Thank you again to our presenters and thank you to all participants. Bye for now.